I would like to welcome the, the new participants as it is uh, the second part of this uh, quantum sensing uh, session. Uh, we, you can jump from session to session. They are computing simulations and, uh, uh, and other um, sessions. Now we will have the last two talks and the first talk will be given by Jacek Strupinski. Uh, he is business development specialist at Vigo System in Poland and he will tell us about epitaxial technology of pixels and photodetectors in application in quantum sensing. So Jacek, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Okay, um, so thank you for the introduction. I would like to share with you some insights on the epitax technology um, and its impact on pixels and photodetectors, uh, which can be used in quantum sensing and uh, in general as quantum devices. So uh, the agenda for my uh, presentation, sorry. Um, the, the presentation will be in two parts. So the first part, uh, the first part would be um, just a brief introduction to our company. I want to share who you are, who we are, and what we do, and to the textile technology in general. And the second part would be the main part. So about the pixels and their application in quantum sensing. I would also want to say a few words about quantum detectors as our quantum devices. And then uh, I will also talk in general how the epitaxy impacts those devices and therefore quantum sensing. So as I said, um, a brief introduction to our company. Vigo System is the uh, world's leading company in the uh, very high tech uncooled photo detectors, specifically for the mid and long wavelength uh, in infrared um, range and for a, a very variety of applications. Uh, this technology has been developed for over 30 years and um, it has been improved ever since. And that's why um, it's, uh, it has a lot of applications and the technology is really powerful, can be used to uh, make many things happen. About the epitaxy division, uh, which I'm involved in, um, Vigo has currently, let's say, two product lines. So the first one, the main one, is the production of photo detectors. Um, though this product line starts with the epi wafers made on MBE and MOCBD26. Then uh, there is this device manufacturing site where the photo detectors are made, and there are also modules which are assembled at uh, Vigo facility. And this second, um, let's say, activity is the Epitex division. So we are manufacturing the 3.5 Epi wafers. Those are related to gallium arsenide and indium phosphide. And those have a variety of applications as well in photonics and microelectronics, uh, not only in the photodetectors, but uh, uh, many, many more. So um, Epitex technology uh, in overall, um, just to explain you, uh, yeah, just to explain more what it's all about. So this is our reactor, it's a 3D animation of it. Uh, we use the G4 Extron reactor. We place the substrates on those satellites uh, into the reactor. Everything is then heated and process gases are injected as it will be shown in a second. And uh, then the actual epitax process uh, occurs um, and uh, on those wafers or on those substrates, um, uh, there will be layers formed. Um, and it's all about creating those layers in a really high precision way to make sure the epi wafer has the high uniformity. And yeah, that's why, that's how the layers are created. And then for example, you can have a pixel structure. So that's uh, uh, a DVR bottom and top and in between the active region. Uh, I will uh, talk about this more in the next slides. Okay, let me change my pointer again. Oops. 
And let's move to the next slide. And so to um, just to give a bit more background about our profile, uh, we are doing the epi wafers, as I said. So we fit here in the whole value chain. Uh, we are doing them on the substrates. And from those epi wafers, the devices on the viewers I made, then the chips, which, were, which are assembled into later into the modules. Uh, Vigo in overall has a wider um, ability to produce also the components and modules. We are, as a Epitex division, we are focusing on AP wafers, and this is our uh, core technology. And in the next slides, uh, I will uh, show you the last part, how this exactly uh, impacts the, the quantum sensing. But first, uh, let me introduce the pixels technology and how it, uh, why it's so important in quantum sensing applications. So pixels um, could be used uh, in, in quantum sensors such as uh, atomic clocks or magnetometers or similar uh, devices with uh, similar systems as was uh, um, discussed on the previous uh, talks today. And uh, for the light source, the pixel can be used. Um, this is one of the, uh, the possibilities. Uh, however, there is a lot of requirements for such pixel to work properly in those quantum uh, sensors. So, uh, first of all, uh, those applications uh, are, of course, very precise and very sensitive. Um, that's why they, are, um, they have the ability to reach higher performances. And the pixel must have a very specific wavelength. So, we say it must be single mode uh, pixel. So, it can be something like a very precise uh, wavelength. Uh, to uh, the 0.8, for example, nanometer. Uh, so with a very, very low tolerance. So with a um, single mode, it's basically that you have no power out power at any other wavelength, uh, only at the very specific one. So you, it's just flat and then there's just one uh, peak uh, at the specific wavelength. If it's not single mode, you will have more of those peaks um, rising until you reach the, the, the certain uh, emission wavelength. Um, however, this is not going to work in quantum sensing. You, you need to make sure it's single mode. Also, another thing is the single polarization requirement. It's, um, for example, important for the magnetometer. And uh, this is more on the processing side of the pixel. So I won't be talking about this too much today. I'll focus more on a single mode and, and how to achieve it. Another requirement is that the pixel needs to operate at a very certain temperature. Uh, tuning is allowed, so uh, that means that you can manufacture the device to the very specific temperature of operations, but, but still you have to take it into account. That at this certain temperature, it has to be a very precise wavelength. And the whole goal of it is to, on top of that, on top of those requirements, you still have to make sure that this device will have a very low noise. It will be a low cost and has a pretty long lifetime, which is also not easy to achieve. And how uh, everything of those requirements are combined into the uh, requirements for the Epitax technology, I will be talking to in, uh, in the next slides. However, uh, first, just to give you some more details about the pixel structure. As, um, so it's, um, this could be the simplest uh, way to show how the research structure looks like. So you have the substrate, and on the substrate you grow the DVRs, uh, which uh, are, the purpose of them is to, to reflect the, the light so they act as, as mirrors. And the light oscillates uh, here, until the laser action. Without uh, these mirrors, you won't have the laser action, so it won't be a laser. Um, and this is, of course, the, the, the main parts, the active region. Uh, so, so this is the whole uh, the, the cavity, uh, two spacers in the active region. Here we have the quantum wells and the cladding layers around it, and together with the spacers, the purpose of it is to confine the electrons here so they don't escape. Um, Okay, uh, I want to show also a few uh, parameters just to um, explain a bit more which of those are important, how you actually measure the, the pixel and its performance. So, as I said previously, you have the emission wavelength. Uh, here it was 
uh, around A50. That, this is the A50 pixel uh, as an example. Um, as you can see, it's not that precise, so it wasn't meant for uh, quantum sensing uh, particularly. A laser current, that would be the current that's required to start the laser action. Uh, output power, this is the, the important parameter because when you have the single mode uh, pixel, you need to close the aperture. The, while you're closing the aperture, you're, you're able to achieve this, this single mode, just one emission wavelength. But when you close it, you also lose the power. So you need to make sure that you have the backup of the power when you develop your pixel. So with closing the aperture, you, won't, you, you will still reach the requirements of the power for uh, the pixel that will be used in the quantum sensing. The resistance is also very important uh, because pixels in quantum sensing need to be um, low, have low power consumption. When you have the resistance higher, uh, then, of course, uh, the power consumption will be as well higher, and that's not how it would be. It won't be just working well for quantum sensing. And single mode suppression ratio, ratio is just um, the, the parameter that shows you how much, how, how single mode the, the pixel is. So, uh, since we are talking about the pixel structures and the, the epi structures of those, um, I want to also say a few words about the uh, quantum photodetectors as they are quantum devices. And there's, there are some similarities in, in the epidaxy and uh, technological challenges. Um, so yes, a few words about for the vectors as well. So um, currently uh, um, there is uh, um, th there's this interesting technology of, of uh, super lattice uh, for the vectors that can, um, that are in competition to the MCT for the vectors um, which uh, are currently made at Vigo, which has been developed for many years and they achieved really great performance. And those are uh, really uh, great detectors. And uh, now this technology of super lattice, yes, um, there is a chance that it will, will um, grow even more in the performance and allow to achieve uh, really fast devices operating without bias um, with good uh, single to noise, to single uh, signal to noise ratio. So here, as you can see, those are some first research, research uh, attempts to um, um, to compare those detectors and the results. So as you can see, it's quite still. So the uh, the superlattice structures are doing pretty well, and then the purpose, I mean, the goal of this uh, project, uh, Vigo currently has would be to develop this technology for uh, longer wavelengths. And now uh, let me um, jump into the, the final topic, but also the, the most uh, broad one. Uh, so exactly how the epitaxy technology impacts the quantum devices and uh, for example, pixels that will be used, that could be used in a quantum sensing. So a bit more information about, uh, information about the uh, epitaxy technology. Uh, epitaxy is a complicated process and how well you'll grow the structure that will impact the device and the quantum sensor. So you have, uh, each layer has a specific chemical composition. Um, you have different chemical elements uh, in each layer and there, is, there are many different layers. You sometimes repeat them multiple times um, and each of it, this new layer needs to be uh, developed. You also have different thicknesses of those layers in the whole structure. Uh, and there is, for example, uh, thickness uh, tolerance. Uh, okay. um, and uh, also the layer strippability, it's, it's important. So you need to make sure that you know how to uh, repeat the layers. Otherwise, if you, you can't repeat the same technology, uh, without the effort, you would have to develop each of those layers and, and that would just take a lot of uh, time and effort. Um, also, the wafer size is quite important. So depending on how the processing later works, you either have uh, uh, smaller wavelengths, uh, smaller wafers or, or uh, larger ones. And as, again, um, 
and there is a doping level, so you also need to control the doping uh, of, of each of the layers. So there's just a lot of a lot of things you need to consider when uh, creating the, the structure. And you also have to care a lot about your reactor and um, um, basically adjust all the external factors and everything um, and, and keep monitoring those. So you achieve a repeat, repeatable, a highly controlled epitaxy process. So you create uh, very well uh, what layers with a high quality. And here are some um, uh, just some uh, measure, uh, characterization results. So you can see the photoluminescence map. Um, it simply means that the, the, the uniformity around the whole wafer is the same. So you know that you can pick this point and you can pick this point and, and this point and you will have the, if you make pixels out of those points, you'll have the same pixel. So with the same wavelength, for example. Uh, if, you, uh, if you don't do it, uh, if you have a not uniform uh, wafer, you will never know um, how, how this pixel, what, what's the, if the pixel would be similar. So you won't be able to achieve similar devices as, as good. Um, this one, the optical, optical microscopy image is a very uh, simple one. Uh, so it just basically shows uh, only that, that if there are some major decays here, you don't see any of them. So, so this is good. Uh, this one, you would uh, think that those are um, some roughness issues. However, it's not the case. This is really on the very atomic scale. So those steps are what you want to see. If there is any major defect, uh, you won't be able to observe those those steps so you uh, so yes when you see the steps um, this is how it should look like um, and now uh, a few words about exactly what's the impact of epitaxy uh, on what's the impact of epitaxy on the pixel performance so uh, first of all you regulate the optical thickness it's not the just the thickness of the layer it's the thickness plus the chemical composition so uh, by uh, adjusting it, you are able to tune it to the, the right wavelength. Um, of course, uh, as, uh, yeah, as I said before, uh, the single mode requires a small aperture. So you need to have some uh, backup of, of, of this uh, power. So the, uh, what, what it means that there may be, must be no defects on the structure at all. So, uh, you have to take into account the uh, substrate and the contamination um, and any, anything that can cause uh, non-radiative recombination. That means that some parts of the, of the structure simply won't work. So they won't add up to the total power and you lose the power. So when you lose it, you won't have this backup to close the aperture to achieve the single mode device. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I have some thing to, so with my screen. Okay, that works. And uh, yes, and uh, if the temperature is higher, then the wavelength is longer. Uh, so as I said before, for the quantum sensing complications, you have to have a specific wavelength at a specific temperature. So, of course, you, you, we don't have to do it, uh, but it has to be taken into account. And the most important thing uh, is that, well, it can be calculated, but there is no guarantee to exactly work. And in practice, it, it doesn't always work as in theory. So everything must be done, uh, must be determined experimentally, and you need to achieve the repeatability so you can um, achieve something experimentally and then repeat it to the next devices. Um, a few words also about the uh, DVRs and the resistance. So the DVRs allows for a bit more of a tolerance in terms of uh, changing and tuning the wavelength of the pixel. However, you still need to uh, have it at the very high quality. So you have this flat um, a reflectance image here and just this one dip that shows the exact wavelength uh, you want to achieve. Uh, for the resistance, as I uh, said, this impacts, um, I mean, if the resistance is higher, 
you can have some uh, voltage drops like on the uh, in between the layers. So the solution for this is to develop the gradients between layers that avoid those voltage drops and you keep the resistance um, uh, low enough. Uh, but of course, this again, another technology development that you have to do. Other thing is the precise doping. Uh, you can uh, use a carbon for it, but it's not something, it's never like this that you can use something that's uh, simply better than, than something else. If you use carbon, you have to do it again very precisely or you will face some uh, surface uh, defects that will uh, impact the performance of your laser. Uh, here, um, one more of the images, I zoomed it in a bit too, so you can more clearly see. But here, um, all the layers are very, very, uh, uh, very similar. At the very similar level, and uh, the distance between them are also uh, looks very, very close. And when one of those layers ends, one of those layers starts, and, and so on. So all uh, looks looks very, very clean. Uh, here, uh, apart from the dopings, you can also see the contamination coming from oxygen. Uh, but this level of the contamination is good. So if you have something above it or there is um, some uh, not regularity here, you would get some, some, some spikes and that's uh, not how it should look like. And this thing here is the active region and that's also change, uh, shows the change in the thickness, the chemical composition and so on. Uh, the actual liquid cell structure looks like this. So you have the, uh, this is simply the zoomed in version of this one. So here you have whole, the whole structure, here is the, the active region, and you can see them in a, a zoomed in image here. Here is five of them, here is just four because one is missing down here. And those are, are the quantum wells and in between the, the barriers. And, um, Going back to the photodetectors, again, uh, it's um, quantum photodetectors are quantum devices and they uh, work on, uh, on a similar way as the, uh, the I mean, the epitaxy is uh, quite similar in terms of the challenges as for the pixels. So you can see here uh, that you have uh, also the, the quantum wells and those are repeated uh, just hundreds of times. Uh, and that requires uh, a lot of precision in developing those layers uh, so the um, device works uh, as it should. And those are very thin layers with a very high precision. Uh, and if you grow them right, you will have this uh, quantum effect occurring and, and you will, uh, you'll get the device that you, uh, that you want. Okay, uh, I think I finished uh, two minutes earlier. Uh, so thank you uh, for uh, listening to this presentation. I hope it's um, shared some insights into the, the, the first, one of the first processes in, uh, in quantum sensing in terms of the, the materials and how much effort you need to put into the, the epitaxy of the materials uh, and how they impact the device like the pixel and later how it can impact the whole quantum uh, sensor. So thank you. And I will be uh, looking forward to hearing any uh, questions uh, if, yeah, if there are any, thank you. Thank you so much Jacek for letting us inside the technology. So we've seen that we need uh, work at the system level, but we also need work in the component level and Thanks to you, we could go into the technology that allows to develop these components that we need for the quantum sensors. Uh, George, some questions from your side? Yes, there are uh, two questions which go also a little bit more technical. One of them is uh, aiming to the line width of the, um, of the devices you, you, you described. Would you be able to, to, to let us know what kind of um, uh, what kind of line width would your lasers uh, have? Yes, uh, sure. Um, so there's quite wide uh, wavelength uh, we cover with our devices. For uh, VIXELs, 
Uh, well, for quantum sensing, of course, um, I'm just jumping into the slides. It could show it um, better. Okay. Uh, for uh, for pixels, you would have a very very specific wavelength, uh, the, um, which is the requirement of the device. So, uh, if you use it for atomic sensors or magnetometer. Um, as it was shown before, there's the vapor cell, uh, which requires a specific wavelength, a very, very specific wavelength of the pixel. Um, so, uh, so, so, um, so to achieve, um, so, so simply saying, you have the very specific wavelength, so the, the quantum sensor can work. That depends on the, on the application. However, in, in general, in uh, pixels, it's a very, very broad range. Uh, it can be um, from, let's say, 850 to um, uh, 1550. So, so it can be very, very, very long. Uh, similar in, in photo detectors, you can have, uh, oh yeah, that's the picture I was looking for. So for photo detectors, the wavelength could be from, um, let's say here, like a mid, uh, medium range infrared to longer, wavelengths. So from here, you can see let's start from two microns to up to uh, 14. Well, it's not covered by, by this uh, specific chart, but uh, the, the wavelength range can be, can be very wide from, from low to, to high. If I may interrupt you, Jacek, perhaps I think the question was more if you know the line widths of the specific laser. Let's say you take the laser, the pixel that you have at eight uh, 154, something like that. If you go yeah. back to your data sheet, do you know what is the the line width at 854 or perhaps at 700, 700, 794? Excuse me, say that again. The, the, the line width of, of your laser mainly. But if you don't have it, it is not a problem. Is, I think the question was that uh, what exactly is the line width of your pulse? Of your, yeah, of yeah. Your uh, well, I, um, I'm not a specialist in the pixels technology itself. I'm more on the epitaxy side. Yeah. Uh, so perhaps that's something that goes beyond this uh, table and, and the parameters, the most uh, basic ones. Um, so we would invite yeah. the, 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 the people that ask this question to directly contact you and perhaps you- Yeah, yeah, that would be great. I can, I can certainly then uh, answer it afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Another question, uh, George? Had the question. Um, and the previous question was uh, aiming towards uh, megahertz, but you will be in contact with him, I guess. And uh, there is another question about uh, changing or increasing or modulating the sensitivity uh, mm. by by the self-powering. This means the hetero structure is has a built-in potential, uh, like this has been done in gallium arsenide versus uh, MOS two uh, materials. Would you know about it? Um, uh, if you could uh, repeat it one more time so I can uh, exactly get the, the question this time. I think the, the question is aiming towards the built-in um, built basically potential from mm -hmm. the heterostructure um, uh, by stacking uh, the device. And if you do a special modulation in order to increase the sensitivity, like it's oh, done yeah. in gallium arsenide uh, with MOS2. Gallium arsenide and most two materials. Yes, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, well, I believe um, that's again something that is the, the sensitivity. Um, that's again something that will be more on the processing side, and from the from the epitaxy, that's uh, what we are trying to do is to allow for uh, for the highest performance epi wafer. So then there is a lot of possibility to work with it uh, in the processing side. So if you want to achieve a very sensitive device, um, then and whichever structure that is, uh, mm -hmm. you, you would still need the FU wafer to, to be simply as, um, as high performing as possible. Um, so again, I would just answer that on our side, what we do at the Dex division is we are trying to respond to many needs of what's been done with the photo detectors 
or with pixels, um, simply trying to achieve uh, the highest highest performance structure. So thank you, Tech, for 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 your answers. Uh, I invite the the people asking the question perhaps to contact you directly if they want to have more insight sure. in your oh, technology. Okay. And we are just uh, wishing you all the best for having this product integrated in the future quantum devices. Thanks, Jacek. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So we are going now uh, to listen to our last speaker. So Felix Bussier from ID Quantique. So I do not have to present ID Quantique. Uh, they are so active in all this quantum uh, field that everybody knows them. So Felix is going to tell you about mastering photonics at the second single photon level. Felix, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Jacques. You can hear me? Very well, yes. Okay, excellent. So, hi everyone, I'm Felix from IDQ. I'm, I'm happy to be able to give this presentation to you this afternoon. Too bad we can't be all together, but uh, hopefully that's gonna happen soon. Uh, QGIS is great, uh, you know, long, long life to it. Uh, really looking forward to uh, the next editions. And, and, and it's, it's, good, it's great to see all these uh, companies in the quantum sensors part uh, coming up. Uh, so really uh, an interesting, uh, uh, interesting developments and, and so on. So um, I want to talk about uh, mastering photonics at the single photon level. Uh, I'm from, uh, uh, this is work from the quantum sensing uh, business unit at IDQ. So um, if, let me just use the pen. So I just want to tell you first by, you know, tell, tell you what gets us up in the morning. What, what is it that we want to do? Uh, in this quantum sensing uh, uh, business. Uh, essentially, we want to empower researchers and industries in advancing the, advancing the frontiers of single front science and applications. This is really, we want to be uh, working with you, allowing you to, uh, to, to take science forward and uh, by building great technology and allowing you to, to use it uh, for these, uh, this uh, great purpose. So, um, so photonics at a single photon level, there's many reasons why you want to go and do photonics at the single photon level. So let me start by going uh, a bit on that. Uh, and I'm, in this talk, I'll talk about the technology, but also on applications that really uh, benefit from going at this level. So uh, there's many examples, uh, like going beyond the classical limits of conventional techniques, quantum key distribution is, and quantum technologies in general are, uh, are examples of that. Sometimes you need higher sensitivity, faster measurements or better spatial or time resolution. Uh, and that can allow you to do that in some cases, uh, or you can improve the SNR and actually do correlations with the photons and, and see through objects. I'll be speaking about this. Sometimes you need to operate in a nice safe uh, situation and that requires operating at the single photon level. So how do you get there? Well, there's the technology of course, but you have the single photon detection techniques you have time resolved photon detection and counting and photon correlation. So, so let me jump into uh, this. Um, so in the quantum sensing business, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, business unit, we uh, at IDQ, we are really talking about single photon detection. Uh, that's the quantum sensing detection that we have here. Of course, it's much broader, but that's the one that I wanna talk about. Uh, so we're making single photon detectors, uh, either semiconductor or superconducting based. Uh, we have this time tagging and control unit called the time controller, and we can combine these two together to, to address uh, a bunch of solutions in quantum physics, uh, uh, optical communication, and general life science, material science, lots of single photon applications there. OTDR, LIDAR, very well-known application of single photon detection, uh, and then surveillance and security that's uh, related to LIDAR and also oil and gas surveillance. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. So, but first, uh, let me just give you a, a quick primer on, on the SPADs. So SPADs are semiconductor-based single photon avalanche detectors. What we do here is we take a, a, an avalanche photodiode and uh, in the gated mode, I'll be talking about this first, we bias the diode below the breakdown voltage. And if a photon comes in, then we get this microscopic avalanche that is that is quenched right after by lowering the breakdown voltage, the, the, the voltage below the breakdown, which quenches it. So this allows to detect single photons uh, in a synchronous way. That is, we have to know when the photon actually comes in. 
Uh, and then one way to do that is by using, for instance, the ID cube, which is our latest single photon detector. It's this very small cube that can be gated. So it generates the gate internally. The all the electronics in, is there, but it can you you tell it when to trigger by using the output of the time controller here. And that generates an, an output logic signal that can go into the input, and then you can do time correlations and, and counting and so on with the device. Uh, the same device, uh, a slightly different model, uh, or, or actually the same model, um, can also operate uh, in a free running mode. That is, the device is always sitting here until the photon um, uh, arrives and is detected, which triggers the avalanche. The, 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 device uh, senses the arrival of this, of this detection and then, um, and then brings the current back down after it happened. Uh, and then it quenches it and then rebiases it after a certain amount of time to avoid after pausing. So this allows to uh, detect light in a asynchronous way. You don't need to know when the photon comes in and sometimes you need that. So in that situation, you don't need to gate it. You just need to detect the output pulse of that. So uh, we have a bunch of detectors for, for different uh, with different specs. So that cube is a, a very ge uh, general purpose device with very good efficiency. The ID230 is uh, tailored to have good efficiency, but very low dark count, uh, getting near to what you can get with the uh, superconducting nanowires or actually very uh, at the same level. ID120 has high efficiency towards shorter wavelengths and ID100 is, is a short jitter uh, and high detection rate in the visible range uh, single photon detector. Okay, so another technology that we uh, that we have is the SNSPDs. So these are the the high end, uh, let's say, high performance, super high performance detectors. The operation principle is uh, is the following: we we make a nano strip of a superconducting material. So it's uh, you know 100 nanometer or so wide, about five to 10 nanometers thick. We uh, cool it down to below, below the critical temperature, and then we bias it with the current that's below the critical current. And when a photon comes in, it's going to br break about a thousand Cooper pairs. And the inter interaction of this weakened superconductivity region uh, with the bias current is going to create a resistive region that you can detect. So to detect that, you put it into a biasing circuit. So the, this current goes into the detector, which can be modeled by a kinetic inductance in series with a switch and then a resistance or no resistance. So that's when that's before detection and after detection, it switches to that, which makes the current leave that branch go into the amplifier. And then this cools down, becomes superconducting again, and then the current, the current comes back in. So at the output, you're going to get a very sharp rising edge and a slowly decaying, uh, more slowly decaying uh, falling edge there. And the circuit is completely passive. It's free running, so it's asynchronous. And the detectors that uh, IDQ is offering are completely Swiss made. Um, I mean, they have the uh, round shape of a, of a watch. Uh, it's not a watch, uh, but at least, you know, it, it's getting close. So we're uh, at least uh, saying hi to the watchmaking industry in, in, in Switzerland, but it's not the same device, all Swiss made. Them. So um, with SNSPDs, what do you get? Well, they're free running. You can get very high efficiencies. I'll be talking about that. Uh, you get very low noise, uh, some cases less than one count per second. Jitter, very good as well. And then uh, detection rates in, uh, with recovery times in the range of 20 to 60 nanoseconds and counting rates in the tens of, of megahertz. Our system has the cryogenic amplifiers inside, so that helps a lot with shielding with the spurious noise you get from having the, uh, if, you, if you would get, if you would have this pre-amplification electronics outside. And also we make it so that the detectors don't latch. So I'm not gonna get into those details, but if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So light is brought in with, uh, with fi optical fiber to the detectors sitting around here in the device in the cryostat, they'll cool down to 0 0.8 Kelvin. There's an upside with S and SPDs. Uh, they are extremely broadband. Uh, so I'll show that in uh, another slide. And you can get in, in this crash that up to 16 detectors. So it's, uh, it can actually be quite a cost-effective solution if you need a lot of detectors and many uh, applications now do need that. And actually you can also do photon number resolution and I'll be showing that as well in another slide. So with this, you can really go beyond and try to enable the application and push the limits and get more uh, in a, uh, something that can be a cost-effective solution with, when you have a lot of of detectors. So you get a performance and also it can, and it can actually become cost effective. 
So uh, there are some specs. Uh, this is a sample detector at uh, 15, 15 nanometers, very high efficiency. So what, what we typically get is between 80% and 95%. So here I'm showing well, like one of the best ones that we have uh, with dark count rates uh, and around 50 counts per second. Uh, it, you can lower this uh, a bit further as low as 10 uh, counts per second, and it's very similar at 1310. So another example here uh, for a detector at 1064 nanometers, uh, again, very high efficiency in that case, around 80 to 95% or even more um, for this system detection efficiency. Here, the dark count rate can be lower, less than 10 counts per second, and around 780 or so, 850, we also get the same specs, but even less of dark count in terms of, uh, we can get something that is below one count per second. So they're really good with efficiency. Uh, and this can be quite broadband as well. So here I'm showing an example of three detectors optimized for three different wavelengths. So this is a detector that was optimized for 850 or so. Uh, so you see that it's pretty flat, you know, so here we're above 80% from uh, a bit less than 800 to close to uh, one micron. This device, which is perhaps the champion of, in terms of broadbandness, uh, is, is, is really good, uh, above 80% over hundreds of nanometers. And it doesn't go down super sharply, it goes down pretty, uh, pretty slowly here, it's just I don't have the measurement here. And then another one optimized for 1310 to 1550 region. And also on that side, I'm not showing the measurement here, but it doesn't drop very quickly. So the detectors are able to detect as well beyond 1550 nanometers. So, you know, if you think of an application that requires high sensitivity over a broad range, like a single photon spectroscopy or a lab device that really needs to detect in, in, a, in several regions, then this is an excellent technology for achieving this. Okay, so uh, the SNSPDs also can do uh, photon number resolution. Uh, the way to do this is to make uh, different pixels and connect them together in parallel. And we do this in a way that avoids latching. Again, this is a bit too technical. I don't wanna talk about this, but you can operate it and you will not have latching and you will, we make it in such a way that mitigates the crosstalk that you would normally have between the different pixels. So uh, by doing that, uh, if you have uh, more than one pixel that clicks, then that's going to affect the amplitude of the output pulse that you get. Uh, this is what we see there. So this is the one photon click. This is the two photon click three photon click and then the four photon click here. And you see that they're very distinct, right? So if you put your discriminator, let's say here, you're not gonna see these here. You're gonna know it's this one and sometimes this one. So it's this or above. So uh, right now we make those detectors with an efficiency that's above 70% and we're working on getting to the same high efficiency that we can get with the other detectors. So, and because you have several pixels that uh, are, can be activated. Deactivating one because of a detection doesn't mean that the other ones are, are not active, they're still active. So in a way it's close to a zero dead time detector. And, for, and with this, we can get to very fast detections, in some cases up to 100, 200 megahertz of detection with a single detector and a single coaxial mod. And the dark count rate is unchanged. So just to illustrate, sorry, I should just come back. So if we were to look at this here, we can move the discrimination level uh, towards negative values, or let's say, let's imagine it's positive, we're gonna see the counter rate go down, but there are some plateaus, which is the plateaus is where we're in that, in this dark regions here. And that's an indication of how good the photon number resolution is. And that's what we see there. So the counter rate, this is one or more photons. It's very flat. And then we have the transition region, and this is two or more photons, very flat again, and three or more photons, four and more photons. We have some detectors that do that up to eight photons. Now, so, uh, and, and the transition region is, is, is really, uh, is really well-defined. So we, we do not mix this one and this one actually. So um, very good devices. If you're interested, uh, I'll be happy to uh, tell you more about it. Okay, so uh, let me just restate that mission statement that I mentioned at the end. We want to empower researchers and industries in advancing the frontiers of single photon science and applications. And so I'm gonna move on to some applications that use the technology here. Uh, so first thing I want to talk about is QKD. I'm going to show two experiments. So this experiment dates back from 2015. So this experiment was at the uh, uh, root of the uh, 
creation, the development of the ID230 technology. Okay, this is a QKD experiment where in order to go to longer distances in optical fiber required lowering the noise of the single photon detection. So that was done by lowering the temperature of the spads there by using a Stirling cooler. Uh, and this is a free running detector. So uh, no need for synchronization. The detector just waits until the photon arrives in order to, uh, uh, well, it just waits and then we'll detect it when it, when it does arrive. By lowering, lowering the temperature, the dark count rate can be as low as 50, 50 counts per second, 50 Hertz, or even close to a few Hertz uh, uh, sometimes. So that, that's really as good or even sometimes uh, better than what the SNSPDs at 1550 can do. Uh, of course, the efficiency is not as good. The recovery time is not as good, but in terms of uh, low rate, it, they're actually pretty good. Uh, so that allowed to go to 307 kilometers of optical fiber. Can it go beyond? Yes, and you need a better detector in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, noise. And that was done with uh, SNSPDs. So uh, this experiment here was using the ID281 SNSPD technology done at the University of Geneva, again, just like the previous experiment in the group of Uh Here, the idea was to uh, lower the noise even more and still having a very good efficiency. So, uh, you know, you can start with a, an 80% efficient SNSPD with 10 counts per second DCR at 1550 nanometers, that's what we see there. And then if you apply extra filtering to get rid of the, the spurious black body radiation you find in the optical fibers, which is, basically the, the whole of the, the noise you get in the detector. It's not the detector itself that, that has dark counts. It's really spurious light photons that uh, get in the optical fiber uh, and then make their way to the detectors. If you play with, if you do an extra effort on the uh, filtering, you can lower the dark count rate to one tenth uh, of an hertz with still a very good efficiency of 60 hertz. And that, that's, that is what was used in this experiment in order to reach 421 kilometers of optical fiber. So again, like pushing the technology with the best detectors is uh, what uh, happened in this, uh, in this experiment here. Okay, another experiment done at the University of Geneva. Uh, so uh, here, uh, the, the goal was to use the ID281 technology and a time controller in order to look at an integrated source of photon pairs. Okay, so uh, Michael Gazeman from Langen Tech spoke about these micro ring resonators uh, made uh, from silicon nitride. That is what was used in this experiment. So you pump these here and through spontaneous four wave mixing, you can generate a pair of photons and you can do it in such a way that you can have entanglement. So you do the analysis here. Okay, and in order to reveal it and you get the best results, you really need high efficiency and fast detectors and also very low jitter detectors and low jitter detection system. So by doing all of this, you can actually uh, look at all the, the specs of your source. And one thing you can look at is the, the G2. The G2 is, is, is this measure of the, uh, how, uh, how close it is to a thermal mode, which is not easy to get. Uh, uh, and what you see here is a very peak distribution uh, of this G2 here, and it reaches, it's very close to two. I think the, the, the current results are still better than that. Uh, and, and that's achievable only by having this, these very low jitter detectors and, and, and uh, time tagger here. Uh, and also the high efficiency and the low noise allows to have some very, very clean and high visibility interference fringes in order to reveal the entanglement. Okay, so next application is something that was mentioned that there was a full talk on this last year at KIDIS. I just wanna quickly mention it here. It's a very uh, industrial application. So we have worked with, uh, we are still working with the uh, ION uh, space uh, to help them uh, in a very difficult problem that they had and that we have solved with our technology. So they have moved here to optopyrotechnics in order to, uh, to create the separation of the different stages, uh, the different uh, yeah, stages uh, of their launcher, the Ariane 6 launcher, which is going to be launched next year. Uh, so it, they use now optical pulses in order to de detonate the charges that create the separation of the different stages. So they need to be, uh, um, they need to be uh, able to uh, inspect all of this and make sure that the integrity is there and that the launcher is going to be operating uh, as it should. So they had extremely demanding requirements in order to achieve this. 
uh, and it had to be a, a commercial uh, a system used in operation, not just for research. And then uh, what we, uh, you know, they, they came to us and asked us, can, can, what can it cut can be done and what we've shown is that this is achievable with SNS, SNSPD technology only and we have made for them several uh, systems like this that they use as a ground equipment in order to test the different stages and actually the system is going to be used as one of the green lights uh, for the go of the launcher so uh, very interesting application uh, very industrial so it's not only uh, cutting edge research, but also cutting edge applications of single photon technology that can use that. Here's an example of, of what the device uh, produces. We get these reports here where we see the different peaks that corresponds to the different connectors. So the device actually looks at the connectors and here everything is fine. But if there's, there's a problem here, so this red dot here, the system is going to provide a, a failed test report. And it, the, all of this can be done with no human interaction and uh, will provide uh, very high uh, reliability, reliability, which is what they need. Okay, another int very interesting application done by collaborators at the DLR in Germany. Uh, they have, in, in their division, they're looking at these microchips here, uh, like an FPGA, and they wanna make sure that everything is, is done or is working as it should. And actually, it's interesting, when you activate these devices there, there's some light that's being emitted. So they have created a system in order to look at the light emitted at very specific points in this device there. And there's really not a lot of light uh, coming out. So if you put a single photon detector like the ID cube and you time correlate the signals propagating through that using the time controller, you can actually see the device uh, operating in live condition. Okay, so let, let's just uh, look at a, a video that uh, they have prepared. And I thank them very much for showing, allowing us to show it. Uh, so this device here was tested. Uh, there's a chains of inverters. Uh, and then what happens is that the current is gonna go through this. If you use a CCD camera, you get a still image, but if you use a single photon detector and you do time correlation, as the signal propagates, you're gonna see different parts of the system fire up. And it's very interesting because you see the time scale here is really, really short. So you need to have a, a, a very fast device and also a device that has a very good um, time resolution in order to see everything uh, propagating into the device. And that's what you see with all uh, the different parts uh, being activated there. Okay, another application is LiDAR, iSafe. So we've been working on this um, and we have built a system, I'll tell you where it was used afterwards, but we built a system where we uh, emit a pulse uh, light at 1550. Uh, if it hits a hard target, light's gonna come back. And by looking at all of this with an, an array of, of, uh, of APDs, of, of actually SPADs, and time correlating all of this using ID900 and the time at which the light uh, pulse was emitted, we can actually see where the hard target is uh, in space. We can uh, time range it. So the interesting thing is, if you do coincidence uh, detection between the different pixels of this array, uh, you can increase your signal to noise ratio. And, and, and it works like this. You know, if you have spurious lights from the background, like the sun, it's going to be emitted at random time. So it's gonna give you a uniform background. But if you have a bunch of photons hitting the hard target, they will make a couple of these detectors click simultaneously. You add everything up and you're gonna see this peak that really stands out outside of the noise there. And if you put a threshold and you keep this and you ignore that, you can uh, increase your signal to noise ratio tremendously. So that's what we did with this device here. Uh, it works up to 500 meters and actually even more. And then um, this was done initially with a very fast rapid prototyping with the uh, OEM version of the ID cube, the time controller. And here were some tests that were, here are some tests that were done in foggy conditions in Bristol uh, where this actually happens quite a lot. Uh, and then uh, what happens is that you can have a target that's behind fog. You still see it there, but in some situations you don't even see it, but because it's a diffuse target, you can use this, uh, uh, um, correlation trick in order to see the hard target, which is the three at, uh, at the longer distance here. So all of this was ultimately put into a small box uh, in collaboration with SK Telecom uh, with the OEM technology of the, the cube inside. And this was, this was demoed at CES uh, 2019 and, and 2020. 
Okay, so uh, last application I want to talk about quickly. I see that time is uh, is uh, getting close to the end. So uh, here you can use lidar plus wavelength scanning around a methane line in order to do gas imaging. And the idea is really to scan the wavelength of your laser, send pulses, correlate the time of arrival. Uh, uh, as well with the uh, wavelength uh, at the uh, emission, and you can scan a reference cell and you can look at what's coming back uh, from, uh, from the light that you have sent. And by doing that, you can also scan position and combine all of this. This is what uh, QLM in, uh, in Bristol did. Uh, they made the system and the measurements and they used our IDQ uh, OEM technology in order to do some very interesting images. This is a plume of methane that was imaged uh, using this system. It's, it's really fast. It's actually faster than any, uh, um, any um, IR, sorry, any uh, gas uh, imaging camera that you, yeah, that you find on the market right now. And it works at very long distances with very high sensitivity. It can also measure the concentration of the gas. So it's really like cutting edge, cutting edge technology uh, using single photon detection here. Okay, so let me come to the end. Uh, I mentioned that I want to tell you why you want to go to the single photon level. So uh, going beyond the classical limits and conventional, and conventional techniques. So QQD entanglement are ex examples of that. Highest sensitivity, faster measurement, OTDR, gas imaging, fluorescence measurement that I didn't talk about are examples of that as well. Better spatial time resolution. So IC inspection, OTDR, uh, LIDAR, and range finders uh, clearly demonstrate that. Improve SNR and see through correlations exemplified by LIDAR and an ISAFE requirements, LIDAR and, and range finders. Okay, so how do you get there? Well, you use the technology and the right techniques and you use the, the power of single photons in order to, to get there. Okay, so if you wanna know, uh, learn more, we have some webinars on IDQ's website, please go uh, and, and have a look. Uh, I wanna thank all of our collaborators. Uh, I wanna thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Felix. Wow, how many applications you could show uh, using your products and amazing to see how electrons are flowing through the, through the FPGA by looking at photons that are emitted. This is just crazy. Thank you so much. Um, I hope we have some questions, George. Yes, uh, thank you, Felix. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you in this driving seat for the single photon. Uh, sources from IDQ. Um, I can also see the history of things developing also from from your research. Um, you had also QStarter and now you basically pitch a variety of industries and I never saw also the FPGA in a, in a, in a basically in a, in a live mode uh, sh uh, shooting electrons out. Uh, one question uh, and the combined question is the following. It comes from Daniel. Um, it would be, what do you think is the most promising single photon source at the moment for industrial applications? So I guess he's aiming towards the, the spectrum of industries. Where do you think it's, it's, it's definitely, there is nothing else what, what can be used to do that. And also he's aiming towards um, what do you care most when you design this kind of uh, single, um, uh, single photon sources, uh, size, efficiency, and here I dare to add my own speed uh, my own questions on top of it. Okay, okay so uh, I don't know exactly what, uh, maybe the person was referring to a true single photon sources, like one photon at a time, which is not something that we do. So here actually when we shoot light, we, we use uh, essentially laser light, attenuate it until we get a single photon one at a time. And that's what's used in QKD, right? So, uh, so in a way, this is a, an easy technology, uh, because you take a laser, you attenuate it to the single photon level, and then you're going to get uh, light coming out either with a thermal distribution or a Poisson distribution. Uh, so so um, that, that, that's, this technology is readily available to do QQD. So our QQD systems are based on this. Uh, if the question is more about like true single photon sources, so, so there, there's, I, I think it, it's best to list the, the true single photon sources company 
speak about it, but uh, for, from my point of view, a very interesting application is, is uh, optical quantum, op, uh, quantum computing, where uh, the, the true single photons is something that you will need uh, to have in a scalable, scalable fashion to create uh, and send light through these uh, integrated photonic circuits, like what Michael Geisman uh, from Ligon Tech spoke about in his talk, where you're going to mix all of them together and do these uh, these, for, for instance, boson sampling application, and you can demonstrate that you can go beyond the uh, the, the the classical limit, uh, you know, towards quantum supremacy. That's a very exciting field that the, the true single photon sources will uh, will allow. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the the specs, again, I don't want to speak for the companies, but obviously the repetition rate and the quality of the uh, the single photon uh, is important and and, all, uh, and also the ability to uh, to have them coupled with a very high efficiency in the waveguides is quite important and, and and well maybe i can add what what you need behind uh, that is really the 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 best single photon technology single photon detection technology in order to empower of this at at the end of the line so the single photon sources are the are at the starting point and that and at the last point we have the detection and, and the processing and this is where we are working on okay thank you felix i think it was aiming towards the single source photon source but we have another question which goes into the direction of the LiDAR application, which is very interesting. I'm, I used to de design radars for, for, for sensing basically um, through the fog. Um, and I guess the LiDAR is here, basically the extension in size and, and accuracy. Uh, and the question comes from Lukas Novotny. Uh, how, how do you suppress basically the background photons in the LiDAR application? Time gating should not work here or does it work? How do you do that? So uh, let me just go back to that slide. Okay, so let, let me just again explain this here. This is the detectors here are free running; they're not gated. Okay, so you just let them detect, right? Uh, and then uh, the uh, the background you're going to get there is from um, is from noise, and the and the noise is evenly distributed in time. Uh, so so it's very uh, improbable that two of these noise counts will arrive at the same time. So they will not add up beyond a certain level. So if you, uh, you know, given the certain noise level, you can, uh, you can uh, put this threshold here to avoid these there. But if you operate the device in the right condition and you have uh, good detectors uh, and then you get a hard target, so the hard target is going to give you all the photons arriving at the same time. A diffuse target is going to diffuse the reflection. So it's going to, instead of having this very sharp peak, you're going to flatten it out. And it makes it very unlikely to actually see uh, the, um, the diffuse target. Thank you, Felix. I think it was, uh, it was the threshold. Uh, it was in the direction of the threshold. How do you basically threshold the and the number or the, the accumulated ones. Do we have time for one more question? Yes, let's take a very last one. It's so interesting that uh... I, I, I would basically come back to the same question. So what does it have? How do you deal with if, if your if your source is basically seeing a storm of um, 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 photons. of photons there and it goes back to uh, Lucas Novotny the question. Uh, well, I mean, uh, if the storm, okay, obviously, if you put heavy, heavy, heavy snowfall <laughs> right in front of your LIDAR, uh, and that's actually a problem with LIDAR uh, for, like, say, automotive, for instance, if you put a super heavy snowfall, then it's not going to give you a diffuse reflection. It's going to give you something uh, quite sharp. So, so, so that, that, that there are situations in which it, in which it it really, it really becomes problematic. Now, uh, if you put also super heavy uh, rain, it can become problematic, but there are situations in which it's okay. So, you know, LiDAR technology is a still evolving technology, but these are the kind of tricks that will certainly help uh, in order to uh, allow the, uh, the LiDAR to work in, in uh, difficult, uh, uh, um, difficult weather conditions. So, Thank you very much. I think we are now at the end of our session. Uh, it was a great time, really. Uh, I think we, it was the aim of, of Kiris also to cover the whole development chain for quantum sensors, going from research to 
uh, development to commercialization and also to see startups. And we, I think we have in Switzerland this ecosystem. For sure, we need our partners in Europe and perhaps also abroad to achieve the goals and to have at the end real quantum sensor going, coming into the market. Um, I would like to, at this point, to thank the, the sponsors that allowed to have this online meeting. So we have Zurich Instruments, IBM Research, Idecantic, the QZIT and uh, Research, InnoSwiss also, CSEM, and uh, the Enterprise Europe Network. Uh, for sure, I want to thank also the, the organizers, all the staff that helped to have this, um, this happening. And also George did a huge job. You can't imagine the job that he did to make it happen. So thanks, George. Thanks to all attendees, to all the speakers. Please, for the next step, get into contact with the speakers. So I speak here to the attendee. Get into contact with them. Try to see what, how they can help you. We need also students that are well-trained and well-educated that allows us to go and to bring this new product on the market. And uh, the next step would be also that we will put the recordings of the whole KIDIS and uh, these different sessions on the website. We will keep you updated how and where to find this, uh, these recordings. And let's hope that we will see you all in person next year at KIDIS 2021 that will take place in autumn. Exactly the date is not defined, but we will let you know about that. So. George, you have something to, to add? No, thank you. You did a great job. Thank you very much, everybody. And see you soon. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.